the place where the Lord gave his Ten Commandments and the rules and regulations and the ceremonies. Why do we drag them up that mountain to show them who God is and what God is and what it means to be a Christian? Because the only thing that we find on, on Mount Sinai is terror and tiredness and depression and death. Uh, consider what the Israelites saw on, on Mount Sinai. A mountain burning with fire, darkness, gloom, and storm. The sound of a sustained trumpet blast. A voice speaking words that those who heard them begged that no further word be spoken to them because they could not bear what was commanded. If even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned to death. The sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I am trembling with fear. The people were so afraid because they heard those commandments and they realized, I can't do that. And they knew that the punishment was death. So why do we try to climb that mountain? And why do we force others to climb that same mountain? Because our sinful nature is so corrupt and so prideful that we believe that we can climb up and touch the face of a holy, righteous God simply by being good people, by trying hard, doing the best that we can, but it's like climbing Everest, all 29,035 feet of it, by our own determination and strength. But never mind that. We think that we're pretty good at climbing Mount Sinai, and we'd like to prove to God just how far we've climbed up the mountain. I pull out of my driveway on Sunday morning and I see my neighbor's SUV parked there in his driveway. And when I come back from church, I see this SUV parked in the same spot and he's out doing yard work. On my way into church on Sunday morning, just about every Sunday morning, I see that pickup truck towing that nice big bass boat or that nice big ski boat. And I think, gee, I don't remember a church on Lake Elatuna. I go to a school event and I see parents and I see how they interact with their children and I see how the spouses interact with each other and I think to myself, wow, I'm glad those aren't my kids. And wow, I would have handled that situation a little bit different. And wow, I don't speak to my wife the way that he speaks to his wife. As you drop your envelope in the offering plate, there's that, that one envelope. You know which one I'm talking about, the one that's face up so you can read exactly what the amount is written on there. And you think, wow, they, you know, they could certainly give more than that. And I show up for, for fall work day here at church and you look around and you go, where's everybody else? Well, at least I showed up. What's worse is that by my attitude, I'm forcing others to make the climb up this mountain. By forcing them to do all the things that God commands in his word, at least the things I think he's commanded in his word, and then condemn them when they fail miserably. Forcing them their hardest. To, to try to touch the face of a holy, righteous God by the things that they do. But as we make this climb up the mountain, all we see are these faces of frozen corpses, frozen into the side of the mountain, hundreds, thousands, millions, billions of them who have tried to summit the mountain of earning God's favor and have failed miserably. But I need to stand here at this mountain, and so do you. 
We have to stand here at this mountain and tremble, just like Moses, just like the Israelites. And we need to hear God's law say to you and me, love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your strength and all of your mind. And I need him to say to me, love your neighbor just as much as you love yourself. I need to hear him say that so that I realize I can't do that. I cannot love my God with my whole being. I cannot love my neighbor just as much as I love myself. Not to the level where God would say to me, you've done enough, come on into my heavenly kingdom. The only thing that I am reminded of is that my works and my efforts earn me the wrath of a holy God. But my friends, We don't have to stand here forever at this mountain, Mount Sinai, wondering, have I done enough? Because the author of this letter to the Hebrews takes us on a hiking expedition away from that mountain, and he takes us to the base camp of another mountain. Actually, he takes us straight to the top. And he says, look, Look at how beautiful this mountain is. And we look, and it sure is. It's, it's gorgeous. It's, it's the most amazing mountain that I've ever seen. And there's nothing terrifying about it. And he says, look at this mountain. It's all been done for you already. The author writes in our lesson, You have come to Mount Zion, the heavenly Jerusalem, the city of the living God. This is heaven, my friends. And he says, you have come to this mountain. This is yours already. You have come to heaven. He says, you have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly. There are cities that are partying still probably early this morning because of their college football team that won their game last night. But the greatest party that this this world will ever see is the one that's hosted by the angels in heaven. And they are praising God and glorifying him because you, you have come to the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. Now being the firstborn child today really really doesn't give you all of the benefits that you think it would. I, I know that. I'm one of them. But in Jesus' day, it meant something. In Jesus' day, being the firstborn son meant that you were first in line to receive the inheritance when dad died, and you received most of it. And you received a very special blessing from dad right before he died. My friend, you are the firstborn son. My friend, you are the firstborn daughter. And you have an inheritance because your name is written in heaven. And your inheritance is worth more than anything that this world can give. I thought about that. What is the greatest thing that this world could give me? Well, I thought maybe if I were the only son or you were the only daughter of Warren Buffett, a businessman whose estate is worth 60, what is it, $64.8 billion. Now, you know that when dad dies, Warren Buffett dies, you are going to receive $64.8 billion because you are his only child and your name is the only one on his will. That is yours. Now, I had a hard time fathoming that amount of money. So I did some math. I could spend $40 million a year or $110,000 a day for the next 25 years of my life before I would run out of $64.8 billion. But my friends, you have something worth more than that. You have an inheritance from your Lord and Savior that will never run out. Your names are written in heaven. And you don't have to try to imagine wealth beyond your wildest dreams because when Jesus died, he included you in his will. His death to sin is your death to your sins. They're gone. They're done. His victory over hell is your victory over hell. 
His triumph over grave by resurrection is your triumph over your grave by a resurrection from the dead. His ascension into heaven is your ascension into heaven. You will live forever because your name is written in heaven. And your name is written in heaven because you belong to the family of God. And you belong to the family of God because God adopted you through the waters of holy baptism. It is here through water and the word that God wrote your name in his family ledger in heaven. You know that you will receive that inheritance because these things are true. It's been done. And you know that this is true because the author then says, you have come to God, the judge of all people, to the spirits of righteous men made perfect. Because there at the top, the author to the Hebrews takes us on this hiking expedition. And he says, look here in this ledger of God's family. There are names in here already, people who are already living in the city of God, who are already partying with the angels. Names like Adam and Noah and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and King David and the apostles Peter and Paul and John. And you look and you see your name there too knowing that one day that's where you are going to be because it's done already for you. And this is why the author to the Hebrews can be so confident. He says, You have come to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. First of all, he says, You have come to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant. Let's go back to Mount Sinai just for a second. There's Moses, and he is the mediator. He is the go-between, between between God and the people of Israel. And he's telling the people, this is what God wants you to do, and these are the things he doesn't want you to do. And if you don't do them, and if you do these things, you're going to die. Let's go back to Mount Zion. Here's Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant. It's entirely one-sided. God makes a promise. God keeps the promise. And he shares that with you through the words of his Son. And this promise is that the sprinkled blood of Jesus speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Who in the world is Abel? If you remember back to Sunday school lessons, remember that Adam and Eve had lots and lots of kids, but two of them uh, were mentioned by name, Cain and Abel. And Cain hated his brother Abel so much that he enticed him out to a field and he murdered him in cold blood. And the Bible tells us that the blood of Abel cries out to God for vengeance, for, for retribution against his brother Cain who murdered him. And the writer to the Hebrews says, now contrast that with the blood of Jesus The blood of Jesus that, yeah, he was murdered too on a mountain. And that blood that was sprinkled in the dust on Calvary speaks and cries out to God, but not for himself, not for retribution on his enemies, but that blood cries out for you and for me. The blood of Jesus that was sprinkled on that hill outside of Jerusalem cries out to God for forgiveness, not for himself but for you and for me. That sprinkled blood that fell on that dusty sod outside of the city of Jerusalem cries out to God for the gift of eternal life, but not for himself, but for you and for me. The blood that we see sprinkled on that, on that hill cries out to God. And it shows us the great love of God, doesn't it? Because God had said from Mount Sinai, you must die. And we go to the elder mountain and see that we have already died through Jesus Christ. And his blood is evidence of that. It's been done already, my friends. So, if we want our our children and our spouses and our friends and our neighbors, and our co-workers, and our fellow church members to live as Christians. Then we take them by the hand, and we make this hike up Mount Zion. And we show them what's been done for them. Because being a Christian isn't about following rules. 
It's about believing what Jesus has done for you already. And it's about living a life out of thanksgiving for what has been done for you already. So keep going back to Mount Zion every day. Keep going back to Mount Zion through your study and your reading of God's word to see what's been done for you already. And if, if we do that, if all of us do that every single day, might there be less stress in our lives? Might there be more peace in our lives? Might there be less judgmental attitudes? Might there be less selfishness and more servant-minded people? Might we be more patient, more loving, uh, better focused on what our purpose is for this life, which is to stand on that mountain and to take people by the hand and to show them what Jesus has done for them? What would our church look like if we all did this every day? What would our community look like if we did this every day? What would our homes look like? What would our relationships with each other look like if we kept going back to Mount Zion to see what's been, what's been done already? My friends, trust. Trust what has been done for you already. And then go. Go and live for Jesus. Amen.